I am going to be showing you a tool that I made, streamlines the process of how of getting data from Neo4j. Um, so first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to get the tool itself and then you're going to want a reference to it. In this case it should be in GitHub. Um, it's Neo4j C Sharp. I don't have the source code available as of right now. I don't know if I want to make it available. But wherever you put it, you're gonna need you're gonna need to find its path. In this case, the path for me is uh, it's still kind of where D Visual Studio puts it by default. And then you're gonna need to specify a couple things. You're gonna need the port that you want it to run on because it's an internal server. And you're gonna want the packet size what's going to come back to you, or at least the size of the pack that's going to come back to you. Whether you want it to show the details, it's just a little debug thing. If, if I connect, it will log, say, hey, I'm connected to Yuri this with the username of this and the password of this. In this case, I set that to false because I don't want to show that. Um, and then I kind of have that stored up here. Show consoles if you're using this for Unity, because that's what I made this for. Of course, you can just use the Neo4j driver example, but it doesn't work with uh, doesn't work with unity unless you get some dotnet frameworks i don't know it just didn't work too well for me so i made this little internal server thing to help showing the console if you set this to false then it won't show the console so when you start your unity thing you won't have a console window open um, and then we need to actually talk to the neo4j application itself so we're going to create a socket um, just your standard stream tcp socket and then since we're kind of the server end here uh, we're going to bind to that socket with loopback and then our custom port and then we're going to listen for it and then we're actually going to start the application so we're going to start it with the path and then we're going to feed it in our custom port so it knows which port to connect to and whether or not we're showing set details um and, and then and then we're going to accept the incoming connection assuming everything went well uh, this should work and then we're going to feed it in the connection info to our Neo4j or the setup info. So in this case, I have this as a variable. I have my uh, the URI, the username, the password, and then whether I want to show the console. This is actually a one or a zero, so I just uh, converted it here. And then we also have our packet size. And then we want to send the setup info. And then I just have a little method here, which is just the encoding UTF-8. Um, and then we're just going to receive this kind of just response, say everything went well. Uh, it's two bytes large. It doesn't actually send any data as of right now, so uh, I'm going to change that in the future though. And then we want the query. So in this case, we have our Neo4j node. I created this just a test node. Um, so test node with the name of test node with the lowercase t. And then I have data64 and data128. And then here it is. There's other stuff in this graph, so I have to return this specifically up here. This is the query that we're going to run. So we're finding said test node and returning its properties. Uh, the reason why I'm returning the properties is because right now what I have doesn't support sending an entire node. So you send its properties here, and we're setting this to as data. Um, and you'll figure this will be important later. If we don't send it as data, then you can see this little top thing becomes properties, open bracket, end. and honestly, it's, it's fine, but um, as data, we'll clean things up later. Um, yeah, you can see we're sending one thing as opposed to like multiple. So, yeah, we can only one thing can be sent as of right now. So, if we go back, we have our query, and then our key, so this is data as you said before the key is what's going to be up here if you look at it the table wise you can also see it in text and then in console well i don't really mess with that too much and then we kind of just put that together we put our query our key single and well all the comments will tell you what's happening here um but single is just if we have a single property that we want then we could just say single and There'll be less string splitting later on, but if you have multiple properties, like I'm showing here, 
then you're going to want to set this to false. And then we're going to send that data. And then we're going to create a new buffer equal to the packet size, or at least the size of the packet size variable here. And then we're going to fill that buffer with what we've received. And then we're going to convert that back into text form. We're going to check if, it was, if any errors have happened. If you were showing the console, you should see there's an error. But um, in this case, this application doesn't know there's an error until we check, hey, does it say error? Uh, in this case, if it does, then it'll throw a new exception that just says there was an error processing our query. But if there isn't an error, which hopefully there isn't, um, we're going to split that by the semicolon and go zero. And the reason why I do this is because if we have, if we're sending a packet that's like 256 bytes larger, at least this is my theory, I've kind of just assumed this was true when I've kind of figured this out the first time I was working with sockets. If we have a packet of 256 bytes and we fill up 64 of them and we send that, well we have 64 bytes of text and then the rest bytes, the I can't do math amount of bytes left worth of just empty space. Uh, and it'll make it harder to do things later. So I add a semicolon where we finished, and then I just get everything before the semicolon, and we forget about the white space because we don't need it. It's garbage. No offense, white space. So and then we're going to also split that. So we have all of our properties that are split by semicolons. Um, you'll see that later. So we're going to iterate over every single property, and we get when we have the single thing set up, if we're getting multiple properties, It'll put the name of the property and then its value, and that's spaced out between a colon, and then we're going to log that data. So we're just going to say the property is the name of it, and then the value is the value of the property. Um, and then we're going to close the Neo4j process, and we're just going to hit, uh, we're just going to make it so the application doesn't close automatically. Um, and then yeah, here are our helper functions to do so. So if we run this, we will see you get the hello world starting, and you can see we got the data back from Neo4j. So you can see here, we've got the property, which is spaced out by a semicolon, the name and the value, and then each property is spaced out by semicolon or uh, commas. Come to think of it, I think I called the commas semicolons before, but yeah, you get what I mean. Um, and it'll kind of tell you the data that it received. So this is also where I can show you, if you have these show details set to true, it'll log up here, like the URI was this, the uh, username was this, and the password was this for debug purposes. And make sure everything's sent properly, because if you're working in Unity, uh, it can just be easier sometimes instead of having to go unityengine.debug.log, because of course you need the system.diagnostics statement for this, and you can't use debug.log if you have that open. You have to specify Unity Engine up here or down there. Um, and then, yeah, that pretty much summarizes it. Um, I guess for funsies I could try not setting it to a single. Oh, also to show that this works, uh, if I, I don't know why I went over here to copy, I tend to just be lazy with that. If instead of sending as data, I can show that this, <coughs> that this, will work. We don't need to use as data here. So just in case that doesn't Oh. I was going to say just in case you can't put as data at the end of it. Why is it in full screen now? I uh, can't put as data at the end of it then it just shows you, hey, it still works uh, in this case. Yeah, we can still use the properties. Now that just about summarizes it.